Hey, everybody. Welcome to Educational Triage. This is Tony. And this is Philip. And we are here this week because we are going to follow up from last week where we talked about what is critical race theory. And this week we are going to talk about what critical race theory is not. It's what it's not. Yeah. So, well, Philip, because you know so much about this because you studied it. And I still feel like a little bit of a babe in the woods. But what I'm understanding is that critical race theory is actually very simple in many ways. Yeah. yeah I mean, just on the offset, I mean, we didn't, we're not able to delve way deep into the meat. But why, yeah. before we get into what it isn't, what is this? Why are people doing all of this weird manipulation with it and getting people all ginned up? Does it have something to do with the fear factor? Is that oh, what it's yeah. about? Or... Well, it's a, it's a boogeyman. It yeah. It's a boogeyman. You know, it's if you need to get your movement centralized, then you find an enemy. That's one of the things you do. First, you find a centralizing cause, but then you find like something that is opposing you. That may be your centralizing cause, but it's always good to have an other or an enemy. And if you, you know, carefully pick enemies, CRT kind of fits into the mold of that, that could be an enemy. If but you, why? yeah, if you interpreted it very strangely. <laughs> yeah. And, and very why? dishonestly, honestly. <laughs> That's but funny. why now? I mean, it seems to me that it's a, it's an odd conflict to have at a time when this we have all these other issues that are coming up with, well, with equity. Yeah. With it, with, we already have racial conflicts that are there. Equality. So why poke the bear in a sense on, on race? Well. That it, critical race theory doesn't actually poke any bears. If let's if let's review sociology lecture one hundred and one. Oh, no, critical race theory doesn't poke the bears. I'm saying, why do these people? Oh, why do the people? Why do the people use it as as a poker? When uh, sociology one hundred and one, I can answer that question saying, okay. sociology one hundred and one. Yeah, if you look at the way people interact in the society, sociolo sociology has three major ways of focusing on its its trade per se. Sociology is to crowds and societies what psychology is, say, to the individual. You know, it's a way of studying how they do their thing and and how you know when they do it. And and sociology has three major focuses: the social interaction, and then the functional. And then the conflict that these us humans have in society. So the social interaction would be, you know, what we do day to day, anything from how do two football crowds um, intermingle, you know, versus, you know, how do you get um, one neighborhood to interact with another? And then the other one would be interaction in itself, functional theory, there's functional interactional theory. And interaction looks at, how people do their things in society break into they break into clubs you know the benevolent protector of the, the clicks and, yeah i mean we all do that and why do we do that and do we do it based on age or what how do we do that and then the last one of course is conflict H how we do our conflict as a society where are the conflicts that sort of thing and that is based on marx's work in conflict theory because Marx focused on conflict theory. He, he, he was the originator of focusing on why do people in societies conflict with each other? And then he wrote political theory. But if you talk about Marx, that's really scary. And all conflict theory does is say in sociology is how are people conflicting? How are they interacting when they're in conflict? What do they do? Mm -hmm. Not in war per se, that's overboard, but conflict itself. And we have a lot of it now. And CRT says that based on that conflict theory, we have to understand that we have a certain conflict about race in our nation, a news bulletin. <laughs> of course, we have problems with race in this nation. And, and I was inclined to go, why is that? And so I went to college and tried, you know, I mean, talk to people, mm -hmm. whatever, I spent a lifetime trying to figure it out. And we do, in fact, 
I, I can confirm it. There is a problem with race in this nation. <laughs> conflict theory fits CRT, fits conflict theory. And, you know, that's basically, if you want to study it, that's how it comes up. And, and then there's tenets of it that just says it does exist and that it serves a purpose. So racism that exists. That's a social construct. Yeah. Serves the yeah, purpose. Race exists as a construct. Yeah. And that it serves a purpose. And therefore, you know, we keep it. And that purpose, purpose. And that yeah. purpose, if I remember correctly, is that it keeps somebody down lower. Well, I mean, it can be any kind of I mean, it's purpose. like, because yeah. we talked yes, about the class right. system. You're right. Or yeah. it, it, what is the purpose of racism then? Well, I would say it serves a lot of purposes, not the least of which is to try to keep the stratification of classes. Okay. And, right, and the classes, the caste system. Yeah, there's the, the wealthy that would convince everyone that um, that they deserve their wealth and that below them, there's always someone below you. And then, you know, down in the South, the good old boy system, they convince the white folks that as low as the white folks could go, they're never going to go as low as the black man, period. Right. And then that just installed itself into the psyche of society in the South. Mm -hmm. And the lost cause myth is a sociological wonderland. I mean, that's just, you know, when you think about what that does and how it does it, that's a, it's a crazy way to, it's a crazy thing to study, but yeah, it entrenched itself and it kept a certain cast of people always poor, you know, infinitely now, and forever more poor. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask, a, let me ask a, you, need. Yeah. from a sociological point of view then. Yeah. Does that, does being given that status then, does that embed itself into the culture? For example, if, if, if the poor whites in the South, yeah feel as though they're better than than the black people yeah. Yeah. Do the black does is that ingrained then somehow on the dna or just in the culture of the black people always it's always ingrained into the culture whether but, it's and then, forced so or it's harder for them to fight out of it yeah it well like i said the first thing about critical race theory is like race is a construct now if you turn that around what I like to say is race doesn't exist per se. It doesn't. We're human beings. We don't differentiate as for color. You know, there's, we have, we share certain traits and those traits that would be, you know, as a human would be, you know, difficult to deal with would be mental illness, you know, mm -hmm. that and, and things like certain, certain uh, disabilities that would hold you back from functioning normally, but we're still all humans, right? And so if you look at race, that's a construct we've completely adopted, embedded and put in the forefront of our brains that race is a thing. And we could not, we can learn not to see it per se. Culture, no. I mean, you want to see and hear everybody for who they are and hear their story. But, but to culture first see is based race is, is, and base your decision, decisions on race is a construct. Yeah. Okay. Because culture is pretty much based on. Yeah it's everything is based upon the environment and the need to survive and then yeah. building on that to make life a little better as you go you through with given, given different inputs that may come through. Correct. Yeah. It, culture is so embedded. It's so you're right. It's, it's, it's economic, but it's also, survival it's just it's it's what it, what makes us humans i mean i really revel in the american culture especially the music i mean i think the mm -hmm. music the, the music that we have created in the last hundred years as a culture is absolutely mind shattering to me it's just unbelievably creative and that was the influence of african meets american meets you know the european and it just became mm -hmm. american it just and that's culture to me. And you can't put a, can't really put a color on that. You right. know, it, if you had to, I'd say it's more African than anything else, but thank goodness, you know, it, it's just, it's an American art form and it's our culture. Mm -hmm. And well, jazz is, jazz was actually, 
very much taken in over in Europe, especially in France. Yeah, they really enjoyed jazz. In fact, they gave a lot of haven to the jazz artists in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> that were trying to escape racism in America. They're just going, heck, I can go to Europe and be treated uh, like Josephine Baker, like a queen, like a goddess. Oh, yeah. She was a celeb galore mm -hmm. in Paris. And in America, she was just, yeah, you know, that woman. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. Maybe it has something to do with, and I know we're not going to solve the problem of race, and I want to get moving on there, but maybe... Maybe America is because we are such a melting pot of so much because we had discrimination against the Irish and the Italians yeah, and yeah, whatever was the turn. next group that was coming over. And, you know, and then during the war, it was the Japanese or any of the Asians, and right. it was also the Germans. So there's this mob it's, mentality it's, that we have had as americans for for two centuries yeah I, we have to have the other mm -hmm. you know we we always have to have the enemy you know it was in in, in a, during world war ii i mean there was a lot of virtue on the side of america we've been attacked we were the sleeping giant we were the one of the rouse we're we came to the aid and, you know, quite frankly, that generation sort of saved, you know, the, the world. <laughs> and um, so we didn't rest on that as much as, you know, get you know, the Japanese, get the Germans, you know, with the, the epithets that go along with it. You know, we became a very racist nation. Well, uh, the epithets that went along yeah. with it, a lot of that had to do with it's easier to kill somebody that you can think of as less than. Oh, and so by asked. using those names, that's where that came from. And, and, I'll have to say, yeah. and once again, I'll say that was a survival skill. You're absolutely right. But I would say that it was, I think, you know, we sort of focused on getting the enemy, you know, within the same proportions as the virtue that we had. We, it was a very kind of virtuous sort of thing for the United States of America. I mean, they were an excellent conqueror. <laughs> they didn't they, they didn't execute everyone, you know. And it was it was it was we could talk about that later, but but we do need an enemy and CRT, speaking of which, it falls into that line really well if you want to create a boogeyman of like what to hate <laughs> in schools especially, especially if they're teaching kids right. that Right. And, and we're going to get into that. that. <laughs> and we're going to get into that yeah. because we're going to talk about an article. But yes. before we do, <laughs> I think that the misinformation, the yeah. true disinformation on CRT highlights that how quickly a lie can spread across the world before the truth is finally uttered. You're and so, so the damage has already been done in so many ways. Oh. And so it's it's very hard to, I think, triage, as it were, what, what <sighs> can be done in You're order right. for people to understand it. Because you have people who are, they want to believe what they hear. And this goes on everybody. It's easier when somebody tells you, and you want to believe them because they are possibly from, maybe it's a sign of tribalism. They're from your tribe. And so yeah. you create an echo chamber. And I think most of us do this. We have an echo chamber where we hear things from people that we want to believe. And so they give us the information that right. we want to hear. And we don't question it. The tribe. Because, I was just thinking, what does the tribe know about CRT? <laughs> How many tribes out there were actually familiar <laughs> intimately with CRT, <laughs> except for the universities and the academics? I mean, I started like, whoa, this is really, I mean, it's deep essays. These are really. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So, so I think that let's, let's explore these things and then we're going to go into mm -hmm. how, how it, what happened in some circumstances in education. One of them that hit 
kind of close to home for me. But mm -hmm. we can go into that. So yeah. let's say that, okay, so the first misconception is that it is a divisive anti-white ideology <laughs> that seeks to promote reverse racism or white guilt. <laughs> That's not, that's not an accurate statement, but... Uh, well, know, this is the misconception. Yes, I'm saying it, it is what it is. No, it's yeah. not. Yeah, it is it's, not what that is. It's not divisive. It is more of what I would call a descriptor. Yeah. It, it I mean, kind of explains... It, it, it explains why things are. That's, that's its goal. Is that not correct? I mean, it's a theory. Correct. This happens. Correct. It's yeah. cause and effect. I think, I think maybe it's best to explain. When I taught African-American history, I taught, at the beginning of the year, I made a disclaimer. And it was very short, but I said, "There's some of this stuff is going to make you uncomfortable. And uh -huh. you know, based upon your race, I go, you white kids, kids are going to feel like, whoa, my descendants did this. <clears throat> you browner kids are going to go, oh, my descendants suffered from this. It's like, hey, wait a second, let's slow down. We're looking at this so we can learn from this. And we're trying to understand ourselves. And then as we went through the class, I would remind them, you know, yeah, that's those people back there were a lot like us. But remember, in that situation, it's not like today. And so I kind of disassociated them a lot of times from that because it is so emotionally charged. And it also I mean, it can also lead to some charging of confirmation bias. Oh, you don't know what to do with that information if you really talk about it. Like just, yeah, example after example of horrible violence. And when you're trying to like get that in a high school classroom, I didn't pour it on, you know, but it's hard to, to talk about somebody being lynched, not in detail, but that the occurrences and not having some of the kids identify with that. You know, they actually killed this person illegally and enjoyed doing it, you know, kind of thing. And, and it's like, yeah, and you have to understand. So, and I teach them that so that they don't fall prey to that sort of thinking and they recognize it when they see it. Because <laughs> okay. that's where history lies. So you have to dis you have to disassociate it. And that was so, always important. Yeah. Okay. So we know now that it's not anti-white. It simply talks about yeah. how race is a construct. Correct. It's a construct and, and had certain consequences in certain places, especially history. When I taught African American history, you know, that's where it really came and, and according to my sources, it's also a challenge to systemic racism. Mm. And, and its intersection with forms of oppression such as sexism, homophobia, and ableism. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you're 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 investigating, you're academically trying to objectively investigate the phenomenon and what's mm -hmm. how it occurs and where it occurs. And when I'm, I'm always trying to figure out why is it I do what I do, even if I do something dumb. <laughs> so why did I do that? Yeah. <clears throat> so it, the next misconception is that it promotes the idea that all white people are inherently racist or privileged. Um, okay. But it's, well, there's a power structure. There is. Is that correct? There is, but it's not just white people. Right. So Robin D'Angelo, mm -hmm. where does she yeah. fall into this? Well, it we're not getting anywhere if we stay in our corners. And if white people don't understand anything other than they're a problem <clears throat> and that they have to correct that problem, they're not going to do it because that doesn't motivate any people. So when you say this group needs to, or this group is, is uh, benefiting from the privilege of it. And therefore there's sometimes there's not guilty of it. That's just not fair because that doesn't help the person understand the situation. It doesn't disassociate them at all, does it? It's not objective. It's you Can you give an example? People. Well, yeah, you white people. That book should be 
all these books should be titled you white people and then the title of the book what that does is that puts a laser beam focus on you white people and that's not going to solve anything that's like trying to solve the problem by removing parts the machine's not going to operate you know you have to take it dynamically you have to appeal mm -hmm. to everybody everyone in the society is suffering from or benefiting from that race that racist structure we've built it just so happens that more people of color suffer than they benefit but i'm i don't benefit generally speaking as a white male as much as the generalized white male would be visioned as i'm i'm right in there in the low middle class doing my thing you know i'm not it's not i'm not the white people you know it's not it's not my problem that I can fix and then society is fixed. It's like it's mm -hmm. a big machine. And it, it does put that, it puts that onus on people, then they just naturally reject it because they, they're not getting any help. You know, as part so, of society, they need to understand everyone's involved, you know? Right. So there's oppression as well as privilege exactly. on all sides. Everybody yeah. experiences it. You know? It's just that, well, if we look if we look for the privilege, we'll find it. That's the confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like as soon as I see a Toyota in front of me on the road, I know that we're going to be going slowly. Oh, you think it's the Toyotas that do that, huh? Well, those people drive and the like Honda <laughs> and, and some Hondas. Those those Honda drivers. I thought it was those Subaru drivers that. Oh, the Subaru drivers. <laughs> we live. We live in the Pacific Northwest. Subaru no, drivers yeah. are. They're getting a little bit better, but they <laughs> seem to think that they have a magic wand, so that if they turn on the turn signal Jeez, to right. move over a lane, <laughs> that it'll be clear for them. They don't have to look. Just to be clear, as a disclaimer, we are not generalizing and or <laughs> prejudicing in any way <laughs> a large group of people based upon a few <laughs> incidents that we've occurred. <laughs> you know, it's, it's terrible. It's true. It's like, if you think about it that way, and if, and they then those Subaru drivers are black. <laughs> it's like, no. now you're disqualified. <laughs> now it's racist, but it is. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, it's no, it's just, not racist. We're well, simply there. There is a kind of person that buys these vehicles. Well, I was just thinking about that. You said somebody then those you know, people who drive them are black, and it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> yeah. Which the truth is, no. <laughs> I've seen very, very few blacks. We were going. We are just getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> Sorry, Subaru. No sponsorship for us. <laughs> okay. All right, it's good. <laughs> now, it does CRT promote the idea of racial essentialism or the notion that race is fixed and unchangeable as a portion of an individual's identity? Not if it's constructed. So the whole premise about critical race theory says we, can, we constructed race as a as the way to sort things. And then that's okay, so, purpose. But yeah, so that's the answer is no. I mean, because we constructed it. it sort so of it's... Is, yeah. Okay. Huh? So what you're saying is that just putting people into a box to mm -hmm. identify them mm -hmm. because of skin color, belief systems, culture what have you, yeah. that that could be seen as the constructed racism well, or the constructed race. Yeah. I mean, if it's the thing about it is, is we've sort of created the category of race and now critical race theory is, is examining the category of race. And its first premise is that race has been constructed. It's a, it's a, it's an imaginary thing. It really so, is. I mean, you could, you could break people right down to their hometowns if you really want right. to. Yeah. Instead of like people from Africa or people from Asia or people from America. Well, I worked with, I worked with some people who were very cut and dry, very, everything is very black and white, not racially, but that's just the term. 
and yeah, very few yeah. shades of gray. They weren't able to conceive of any shades of gray. And I think that as a culture, we're getting to that point where there are no shades of gray. They talk about mm -hmm. nuance, but right. these are the people who are baiting other people as far as yeah. saying something and saying, oh no, you missed the nuance of what I was saying. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether or not in education, because Google gives us the answer so quickly, ChatGPT and the other AI bots will give us the answers very quickly. Yeah. We don't really have to think <laughs> about it. And there was a really interesting article in the conversation about everybody has to be right. Yeah. You nobody, know, what is that? nobody will say, true. I'm learning this. And so, and, and there is no comfort for people who tell you, yeah. I'm just learning this. Can you help me? No, you have to be right 100% of the time. You should have Googled it. You should have done this. And so we we keep talking about giving yeah. people grace, but we just don't. And That's so I, I'm I, just... I was thinking about that. You're absolutely right. Because people will get, they'll um, argue uh, with an expert when they're not even a novice. I've seen that. Right. And it's like, wait and a I, minute. You're, so you're just there. You're not get, getting the solution. You just want to argue. And that's very clear because it was just, that's all they did. There was, there really was no striving for any kind of compromise because they just wanted to argue with the person. And, but the person was so qualified and they were so underqualified. They just kept on talking and it was just fascinating to watch. <laughs> so, wait a minute. You're arguing with a doctor about how to do surgery and you're a, you know, I don't know, you're, you work in a daycare center. It's like a big difference in professional knowledge. You know, it's crazy. I was asked to, I was asked to, I was asked a question and about something and I was caught off guard by the question. And I, I was in a room with a group of students and the teacher glibly threw this out. But this one student kept turning around and giving me these, I'm going to have to say that they were ridiculous answers. <laughs> and so here I am trying to think about what it is, what are the questions or what are the statements that I'm going to say on something. And then they just come back with these really stupid, con and, and I will say stupid because the whole, yeah. the whole idea was to throw me off balance. Until finally, I just said, you know what? I don't know. You guys can figure it out because nobody else wanted to participate in the conversation because it wasn't a safe conversation. It wasn't a safe conversation. That's a and, good phrase. And I think that we need to find ways to make conversations safe. I mean, when you are challenged by somebody to talk about something, especially something along the lines of, what is race? What are the rights that should be afforded to all humans? It should be something where there, there should be an unwritten agreement that we are going to listen. And if we disagree with somebody, we can say, yeah. I disagree with you, and then point out the part that you either don't understand or that you disagree with because you cannot argue unless you understand where the other person is coming from. Exactly. Yeah. For example, it's... for example, I taught, I, I would teach biology and one of the first components of biology that I would teach yeah. was, well, Darwinism. Of course, except I would ask my students, and it's really mm -hmm. interesting because you, I create a safe environment as I can. And I say, who in here believes in creationism? And it's perfectly okay. You can believe in creationism. You can believe in intellectual design. You can believe in Darwinism. And we talk about the theory of evolution. We talk about, I, I try to give them this information and there's a short video on the creationist theory because there is a creationist museum, believe it or not. Oh, I know. And, and, and it's fascinating stuff. And so I tell my students, 
who want to learn more about Darwinism that they are going to take either intellectual design, intelligent design, or creationism. And the kids who are doing those two are going to have to argue for evolution. And they're going to have to learn the facts of it. And then they are going to have to present how it works, what the theories are, because I don't want somebody coming out of my classroom who says, I was forced to learn this, but I cannot believe in what I believe in. That's fine for you to believe in what you believe, as long as you understand where the other people are coming from. That's mm-hmm. called it, that's called intelligent query. That's true. And there's a little bit of compassion mixed in there. (laughs) Right. It actually involves you in the subject and the subjects of the thing. Yeah, yeah, because you need to you need to understand all the heuristics of what it is that you're doing, right? So if you're given a polemic if you're given a polemic like how was everything created, what's what what kind of timeline do you have? Then or that too. Then they go in and then you know, they can talk to their parents, they can talk to other people, except I have people come in and tell me that they are coming in to teach my kids about the Bible. And I tell them that I'm coming to your church and I'm going to preach for you. Um, and they yeah, say, that's not know. a, pr-. they said, that's not going to happen. And I said, exactly. So yeah, they said with you, like school prayer, you know, you know, you want you to do school prayer. Go, you want me to do school prayer? Right, look at me, <laughs> me to do school prayer. You do not want that. Yeah, really, you don't. It's not the place. It's just place and setting. And right. And I was thinking when you're talking, one of the things is I was thinking about the veil, and then I started thinking maybe it's thicker than the veil. Maybe it's like a burlap sack. This burlap sack of BS kind of that goes over people's heads and they start to believe stuff that's clearly not worth believing and they defend it and it's clearly not defensible. And well, they don't understand it. They just, well, if I don't know about the flat earth guys, but it's, I thought we all understood because there's pictures. Well, you know, (laughs) know, there's people who can test it. I mean, there's enough evidence to say to believe that the earth is flat is just downright silly and you're just being kind of confrontational because but if you think about the ancient greeks off. if you yeah. think about the ancient greeks they the believed that, that greece and everything was right here right <laughs> yeah. in the center yes they did and mount olympus was <laughs> right dead center of all that and surrounding them was the river ocean yeah and on and, the other side of that were the elysian fields now, if somebody were to come to me and they could give me a really good argument about that, then I would say, "Great, say, I'll go for that." But Show the truth me. was, Tell we me found that. out that, but that, didn't, that that wasn't unless right. you were way that, back then. It was just right. wishful thinking, kind of like yeah. <laughs> and as <laughs> I get like, older, like, as I get older, there's more to the entire idea of the center of the Earth. And the river, ocean, and the Elysian fields. There was far yeah. more. But you also have to remember about their level of technology, their level of understanding, their level and and the basic level of education that they used to have back then. Because our, well, our students, mean, yeah. every student that we have is is extremely privileged for the most part in in how much education that they are actually given. To, yeah, to a certain degree, you're in right. In front of them. Yeah, you are right. However, Whether, I still contend that that you're delusional if you believe the Earth is flat because it's not. <laughs> it's just we know it's okay. not. Okay, but we and, can and agree so to, to do agree. that. To do that would be like, hey, now you have to kind of like waste, stop wasting people's time by trying to convince them of something that we all know is absurd. Because you want to believe it, you know. There's a certain point where evidence has to be here in your in your face. You go, yeah, I see that. That's evidence. I don't know if the Greeks would have seen it. They, I don't think they conceived it, but we sure can. 
And then, well, they so were. That's what I say with the uh, burlap but, sack of BS that sometimes we throw over ourselves. But if you think about it, back then, the Greeks were very much connected with the ocean, and they still are. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why. It and so they it's, were, if you think about the great armies that they had, I mean, the Spartans, the Athenians, the Peloponnesian Wars, everything. But mm -hmm. the Greeks actually went over and they conquered Rome. They conquered Italy. They conquered uh, Sicily. And then all oh, these people came back and then they, it was this weird they thing where they too. went back and forth, back yeah, and forth. Did. And so, and, you know, and then they went down to Africa. So back then you still had the messagination that was going on back then. That was, yeah. it, there was, there were no laws against it whatsoever, really. I, so I think you were taxed. Hmm? I, I, you know, I don't know a lot about Greek history, but you were probably taxed by your Greekness, your citizenship, and your and your status. Probably your status. But then if you also think about the fact with the Moorish influence of invading Europe, oh, when yeah, they yeah. did, there was a lot of miscegenation that happened at that point as well. We're so, mutts, all of us, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, well, we really basically are. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's a bunch of white folks walk around harboring African DNA and, and vice versa. I mean, it's obvious, so. Right, yeah. right. Racist. So, mixed up. <laughs> okay, next yeah. point. Some people suggested that it's being taught in the schools. Yeah, no. So people are worried that their children are being indoctrinated. So, and I think that we can now bring up this article from the New York Magazine, which was... <laughs> Which was how to manufacture a moral panic, <laughs> mm -hmm. correct? Yep, Christopher Rufo helped him sign up for over racism education with mm -hmm. dramatic and dodgy reporting. There it is, dodgy. Yeah, it's sort of, it, a lot of the times people are trying to pursue a story, but they already have the outcome in mind, and that is not a decent way to inquire. Well, here's my question because yeah. if and I and I have the article down in the show notes. If you look at the article and you read it, it's it's intriguing because I don't see anything wrong really with what's going on in the one teacher that the first teacher, his name is Tolketa. Kuwatin, no, and, yeah. Yeah, and he he was teaching about the Mayan culture or the Aztec culture. Yeah, and so this this journalist, yeah, Rufo, decided that he was he he drummed up this entire mythos about what was going on in there, and how he had designed a curriculum where they were talking about human sacrifice and cannibalism yeah. and doing yeah. all these wonderful things. And the kids were supposed to be shouting to these gods, which to many people could, could be tantamount to devil worship in many ways. And That's so nice. getting the religious zealots yeah. all worked up about this because they don't know any better, but they're, also not the kind that are going to investigate and well, delve in, any deeper. Isn't that ironically and strangely accepted? <laughs> if somebody says something about something and they didn't investigate it, contempt without prior investigation, I don't trust that source. Right. But then it's, yeah. he publishes, he publishes in a journal. It's on the, it's on the conservative news News Again, channels looking for the outcome, working backward from the outcome that they want. Right, right. Yeah. He even went in there. He even was arguing with Joanne Reed on MSNBC oh, Joy about Reed, yeah. all of this. So yeah. it's well, very, crazy. very strange <laughs> because he made such an impact in fear mongering. Is basically what he did. 
and well, giving out so much disinformation. Why was it fear mongering? Because when you read it, you get scared. It's like, wait a minute here. So yeah, that's fear mongering. It's not. It's not objective. Right. It's not. It, it's if not you were to honest. teach about Comanche, the Comanche society, the fact of the matter is, you'd have to edit a lot or tell the whole truth because they delighted in murdering and torturing people they captured. They, it was a, it was a thing they all even the children enjoyed it and it was like it, that makes me mad you know it's like hey that's wrong but that happened like you know 150 some years ago so that's gone mm -hmm. but you have to talk about that if you want to talk about Cherokee society or I'm sorry Comanche society and so I guess if you're going to talk about this yeah but to like I, I wouldn't want to like actually how did they scalp people or what specifically how did they torture people it's like no it's you, you, you study that in college if you want it's it's just a mm -hmm. no it's like high school and so it's, if you're talking about public school then okay maybe you don't teach it or you don't teach it in depth and when you talk about it in depth you go to college there's books you can always buy a book it's a it's a perfectly one book called the people of the summer moon it's it's an excellent book it tells you all about it. Comanche the more you society. read, the more you learn. Yeah. I mean, are we going to say, well, that book makes some people uncomfortable. Actually makes me uncomfortable too. So I don't want anybody in myself not to read it. To read it. It's like, that's insane. Mm -hmm. So it's not indoctrinating. It's just that you have to kind of deal with it. Right. I get mad. Right. You know, and you just have to learn. The because the peasants, yeah. Yeah. I will say that my district where I was working, they are pretty progressive. And I came up with a, that because there are no standards, I had my students learn how to, part of, part of their one semester credit was for them to watch these videos about human migration in the early days and moving across mm. and starting and how, mm. how the world began to be populated. And then they had to study I'm trying to remember because it's been a while since I read it because it was a few years ago when I wrote it. They they have to <laughs> identify and they have to learn about one of their own culture or one of their cultures if they're mixed. And then they can identify that and they can learn their ancestry and learn more about that culture and what components of that culture they still honor today. Yeah. And yeah. how yeah. did that and whether or not things are still happening over there and how did that because we're and even with the age of exploration in a sense i don't care where you are in the world you still had groups of people from all seven continents yeah. who were they were out there navigating and exploring so yeah, they were and, and they were I gave them examples. And they were enslaving in many mm -hmm. cultures so they were all, all these cultures were doing all these things that humans tend to do. Right. But that was, yeah. but they put a quash on that because they wanted to keep with the mandated social studies curriculum. Yeah. We don't want to talk about that. It, right. So that went down the tubes for the credit recovery and for the high school completion kids. So, but, it, uh, but. Yeah. Back onto this, we have to think about. We have all of this. He he was very effective in ginning the crowd up and getting people to listen to him, yeah. and I believe that possibly people were duped by him because they thought he was an actual journalist who had actually done his due diligence, but they didn't do their due diligence with mm -hmm. him, and mm -hmm. so. He's, yeah. He brings up things about diversity training. So we have to be careful with that. He got... Yeah. Well, he was you know, working with James O'Keefe at one point. He and James O'Keefe from Project yeah. Veritas. And James O'Keefe, I think, got rid of him, didn't he? I don't know the specifics, but I know they worked together. They worked alongside each other. And it's like James O'Keefe was a very dishonest quote, journalist. So... Anyway, so then they come to the Tiger Twalton School District, where I used to work. <laughs> yeah. Lucky. And now they're now he says that the director of equity and inclusion is dictating that people follow the tenets of 
Paulo Freire's Pedagogy oh, of Freire. the Oppressed. Yeah. Now, if you thought critical race theory was complicated, deep, let's go so, with Paulo Freire. <laughs> so, pa- here's what I'm going to say about Paulo Freire's book, and that uh, yeah. is, boy, what is it? He says, okay. Oh, yeah, needs, quote him. Here's here's what they're here's here's <laughs> here Pedag- the tenets of Paulo of the oppressed. Pedagogy of the oppressed is uh, the teacher and the uh, students more. need to be collaborating. We mm-hmm. do that in alternative ed. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the reason why I'm going to go through these tenets is because <laughs> yes. not everybody reads Friere, and it's no. not a book that's easily digested. You need to actually go through it, and you need to be reading it with other people so that you can dialogue your way through. There's a lot of background to his stuff that you, if you don't know, it's like, what? <laughs> so you have yeah. to ask somebody, oh, I know about that. Yeah. It's, so it, this is goes, this is just it boiled down, okay? Yeah, yeah. Then there's conscientization, and it's about raising critical consciousness because students should be able to examine the world around them critically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and take action to transform it. If that means political action, if that means going in and volunteering, there, there are far more other ways of taking action than politicizing everything. Problem-posing education. An approach to education that's based on problem-posing than just memorizing facts. You mean outcome-based or project-based? Exactly. Based? Outcome based. That's what, they, that's what it is. Yeah, I'm so solving students problems. Students are encouraged to ask stuff. questions, challenge, and engage in critical thinking. And fail. Contextualization. And try again. Yeah. Lived experiences of the students so that the learning is relevant to them and to their problems, their issues, and where they are, where they're going. Then there's the idea of praxis where education should be linked to action, where you should be looking at real world problems and students should be trying to solve them. So it's not just these are the problems. It's how do we solve these problems? So there's a lot of critical action. And then you have the humanization because we need to fulfill the full potential of the individual. I want my kids to be feeling as though they are not just worthy, but they are also capable of doing a number of things. And if they realize that they fall short on some issues, well, they can figure out a way to get there because every kid is an individual. And in alternative ed, we want our kids to be individualized. So this, these are basically the points that we have from uh-huh. Freire. Yeah. Pardon? Well, I don't know about we want kids to be individualized. I think we we yes, honor we do. their individualization. I think we also want kids to learn how to work in teams. I always Well, they have to, to learn how to work in teams. And teams and things like that. And, and well, give if up you want to clone your kids, do you want your yeah. kids to be clones? Well, they, they would be another being like them, but they wouldn't be the same person. No, I mean, that's kind of a strange Because thing. they're an individual. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, and yeah. Every, I mean... Every yeah. child, every child, every student brings their own skills and talents. Exactly. To the team. Every human brings ev- their own their own right. story. But they them. are absolutely. different right. individuals. Oh, absolutely, everyone does. That. So yeah. because yeah. because I just don't want to treat. I don't have to teach them to be individuals per se. I just really respect and encourage it, and that would be true. Everyone's responsible for them. Right? Okay, let me get back to let me get back to the Tiger Twelton deal. Oh, you never. Yeah, I was going to say wait. Just you got. I, I was okay. just the thing about that. You got to down to back that. on this. Okay. He, now, thinks, he thinks all that's Marxist. He thinks Paulo Freire is Marxist. He thinks it's all Marxist. And, and Marxist. Freire like, is a Marxist. Is, yeah. He is a. Yeah. Freire is a Marxist, but his yes. ideas are the ideas that we teach mm-hmm. and that we honor. Because he's the same ideas. No, in many ways, they are the same them. ideas that the Jesuits teach. And that other people teach in their curriculum and have for millennia. Right. So these are not, this is nothing new whatsoever. So, and I know that Zinnia Un looks out for kids 
In fact, yesterday I was told about something wonderful that she had done for my former program. So kudos to you, Zinnia Un. And then we have all these other ideas and things that he talks about. But what he does is he takes a little pea and turns it into a bowl of mashed potatoes. Mm. So a lot of what he has said and a lot of the misinformation that people are getting is based on pretty much a concoction of lies that has mm. nothing there so that the boogeyman is there. A and so it's sacrifice. not just the race. It's not just the racism that's yeah. being the boogeyman. Yeah. It's the whole concept of a theory. So it's almost the same. We're almost at the same place that Darwinism was before we hit the scopes trial. Is that making sense? It does make sense. It's absolutely freaking nuts. Because it just, it's like you come to a certain place in your logic and go, yep, that's all the logic I have today. <laughs> no mm -hmm. more. Every other decision I make from now on is going to be completely based on whatever I pull out of my keister. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't the understand. Problem is, is People, that adults acting like children and getting away with it. And it makes me angry. In a sense. Yeah, that's the kid's In a sense, table. yes. Yeah, there's the kids' table and there's the adult table, and there are an awful lot of morons at the adult table. I think they need to go to the kids' table and discuss things on the less complicated level. And it happens on both sides of the aisle, though. Oh, it, just people like that are just people like that. They should be at the kids' so, table. And yeah. there, 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 a lot of times I hear people talking about things, and it's like, where? Where are you getting these ideas? Because they are so misaligned with what you're talking with, with whatever it is. Some of them are just and so, kind of made up. It's like, wait, that is totally made up. No, right. it's not. No, it is. It's got to be or, because it's crazy. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> people, people choose their belief system and they will. And this is really interesting. People will defend a lie. As Absolutely. long as, as long as it is a person that they believe in, it's almost like Stockholm syndrome. Well, it's like it, it serves a purpose. They believe the lie if it serves a purpose. They will. They will push the forth is. the lie. Yes, that's true because too. it serves a purpose. A promote it or withdraw it or tweak it or whatever mm -hmm. it does to get the purpose done. And that's what critical race theory said about race. The, the, the complete fallacy is that race is a thing and that mm -hmm. we go out of our way to make sure it matters a lot in all kinds of complicated ways. Here's a question. Yeah. Is racism profitable? Extremely profitable. Extremely profitable. It builds nations. So think about that. But is it is it is it profitable in the United States? Absolutely. Is is being divisive in the United States profitable? Oh. We all know that. Very based upon For some people seen, it is. Lately somebody got called on it, but <laughs> <laughs> they, got, they got rid of their problem, I guess, and now it's all going to be better. <laughs> I remember when it was announced. I have to say that the straight face. We're, we're observing the highest in journalistic standards. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. It, it's very profitable, and that was the whole point of that. They were yeah. willing to go completely off whatever definition of journalism there was to make to not upset their audience with the truth. Right. And that's news is the truth. It's like, don't be in the truth business if you don't have any. And there you go. Well, people and be honest pushing, about it. Yeah. I mean, people pushing their status when they have none or they've created it themselves and then panned mm -hmm. it to an audience that just grants them the, the numbers. Right. We, we don't have to listen to that. It's sort of absurd. We but have sometimes a lot of problems it's with a, our nation. But yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't do but, that. Way. But sometimes it's like saying don't look at an accident. 
Yeah, everyone wants to look at the accidents unless you did. I, I was a paramedic for a bunch of years. I don't like accidents. Like, oh, maybe someone asked me to help. I don't want to do that either. I did that. Yeah. I'd do it. But it's like accidents are kind of like if you did it, like if you're a rescue person after a while to your job, it's like, oh, it's not thrilling. Mm. It hurts your heart. Kind of like the stuff that's happening on TV where they say this outrageous stuff that isn't true. It kind of hurts my yeah. heart. Like, that's just not true. Don't tell people that. It's not helping mm. anything. Like, okay. see, let's get at this Christopher Rufo article. So let's wrap it up. Yeah. In conclusion, it's not divisive or anti-white ideology. It's a descript it's it's something that describes what's going on and explains where racism came from, how it's used. Yeah. It does and, and, not promote the idea that. All white people are inherently racist or privileged. Mm. Privilege and oppression happen on both sides, on all sides. Yeah, everywhere. Um, all yeah. around the world. All around the world. That's what I meant. Yeah, everywhere. Not just me. It's not Racial essentialism possible. and that race is fixed and unchangeable as part of an individual's identity is not correct. Absolutely. So, and we, and there's not the indoctrination that's going on in schools. If a teacher is doing something about some kind of political indoctrination, that has nothing to do with CRT. That has yeah. to do. That has to do with somebody who is not doing their job. Yeah, I was so, going to make a comment. If your kids are learning CRT in high school, they are extremely smart kids. They're, they're studying graduate school stuff. <laughs> but concurrently, you can't teach, you know, CRT at the high school level. It's too complicated. Or and you can't go anywhere in the elementary school level. And if you're teaching kids to feel bad about their race, that has nothing to do with... That's on you. That, that's bad teaching. Yeah, that's because not... every child should be cherished and welcomed, wanted, needed, valued. Yeah. We're all part of the same team, man. It's like <laughs> I want everyone working with each other. I want to stop arguing, resolve. Yeah, you know? exactly. That's what I teach. So, okay, so we're going to wrap up, and cool. I want to thank everybody for showing up. Make sure that you do hit that like button, that you hit that subscribe button, that you go for notifications. And that you also leave us a review, leave us a comment for those of you on YouTube. And next week, we will have the indomitable and wonderful Dr. Maria Christina. And she will take us through some ways to alleviate stress and anxiety. Things that are simple. Things that you can incorporate in your daily routine. So until then, Philip, thank you so much. Okay. I will see you soon. And same to everybody else. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.